I'm Dean Sackulis, Dean of Douglas Residential College, and I'm absolutely thrilled to see what a great crowd we have and so many familiar faces. Uh, this is truly a high point uh, for Douglas Residential College and for me uh, as Dean to welcome Joan Snyder to campus. We've been preparing and anticipating for this uh, visit for a very long time. I'm honored to introduce Joan, not only as an alumna of Douglas but more importantly, as an innovative and pioneering woman artist. Born and raised in Highland Park, Joan Snyder received her bachelor's from Douglas in 1962 and her MFA from Rutgers in 1966. My understanding from studying a bit about Joan Snyder's work is that she came late to art in her Douglas career and it was pretty late when she found her passion. Um, and maybe at some point we can hear about that wonderful lesson is to sort of work your way through lots of different things and so you sort of settle to, to what feels like home yeah. to you. And I think her life is an example of that. She was a recipient of a National Endowment for Arts Fellowship in 1974 and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship in 1983. In 2007, Snyder received a McCarthy <laughs> Fellowship which for those of you who don't know is one of the highest honors for achievement and is nicknamed the Genius Award. She currently lives in Brooklyn and Woodstock, New York. Joan Snyder's introduction into the New York art world began with a series of paintings completed in the 1970s. These paintings were the basis of her first, her first solo shows in New York City and San Francisco. Although Snyder's paintings are often placed under various art movement umbrellas, abstract expressionism, neo-expressionism, and feminist art, the changing nature of her work with its combination of personal iconography, female imagery, aggressive brushstroke, and accomplished formalism has kept her steadily untagged. Snyder's work is in many public collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the New York City Jewish Museum, the Guggenheim, the High Museum of Art, and the Phillips Collection. 2005, the Jewish Museum in New York presented a 35-year survey of her work, a traveling retrospective of Snyder's prints called Dancing with the Dark, Joan Snyder Prints, 1963 to 2010, recently opened at the Zimmerly, which I understand many of you will be seeing later. Here is uh, a magnificent <coughs> book drawn from that exhibit. So we have a copy in college, find at the bookstore, um, and you'll uh, be seeing the work in the flesh at the uh, Zimmerly. It's, it's really extraordinary. In 1971, Snyder founded the Women Artist Series, which is housed in the Mabel Smith Douglas Library. The Women Artist Series, now called the Mary H. Dana Women Artist Series, is the oldest continuing running exhibition space in the United States dedicated to making visible the work emerging and established women artists. Institute for Women in Art, including <coughs> Ferris Olin, who we missed this week, Judith Brodsky, um, for, and Judith Brodsky for bringing Joan Snyder to campus as part of the Estelle Lebowitz Visiting Artist in Residence Lectureship. I'd also like to thank Assistant Dean Rebecca Reynolds for organizing the visit for our Douglas students and for always bringing art to our wonderful college. So please join me in welcoming Joan Snyder. Thank you. So here I am finally. What I'm going to do today is um, talk about my work and my career um, over the last maybe 40 years or so. In other words, give you a survey of where my work began and where it is now. Um, and I usually do this for students because I like them to see the process and the progress and the, you know, what, what one has to go through to, to make a body of work, you know, or to make a lifetime's body of work. The landscape called the Barn Snowstorm, which um, when I was a senior at Douglas, I studied sociology with Emily Holman, 
And I then went to live on their farm for maybe a year, maybe less. But, but I did live with them for a while and, and start making many outdoor landscapes while I was living there. Um, I should say that I didn't begin painting until I was a senior in college. So I know that most of you are, are freshmen or transfer students, the students that are here. Um, I, was, I was a math major first, then I was a sociology major, and I graduated with an AB in sociology. But um, as a senior, I, took, I, I just wanted to take a painting course. And I convinced them to let me take a painting course on the Rutgers campus without taking any of the 101 introductory courses. I mean, I don't know how I took my way in. But miraculously, I did. And um, I was painting for about six months. And then suddenly, the, uh, my professor named Billy Pritchard said to me, how do you like Yavalensky? Well, I grew up in Highland Park in a you know, working lower middle class family where you don't have to be working class to have no culture, but there was literally no culture. Like, you know, we didn't go to museums. We didn't, you know, I knew nothing about music or art or anything. All I knew was I wanted to paint. Um, he said, how do you like Yavalensky? He dragged me up to the slide room, and he showed me some German expressionist and Russian expressionist paintings. Well, I'm of German, Russian, Jewish, Ascent, and the, the paintings just resonated with me so profoundly that, you know, it was that one moment with one professor that set me on my path, really. Um, so anyway, this is, this is uh, a landscape that I did in 1963, the year after I graduated. Um, that's actually a, a painting of my grandma Cone's funeral. She was in, lived in New Brunswick. Um, and you can see the little coffin there with people going, being around the coffin. Now at this time, I'm sure that I was looking at Blamain. I don't know. I'm going to name some names, and, and maybe you've never heard of these painters, but, but I think that I definitely had a relationship with a Russian painter named Blamain. Um, so to, to move on quite strongly, this is a painting that I did in graduate school. What I did was I, I painted for a year on my own, took a car full of paintings over to Reggie Neal, who was the head of the art department. <laughs> you could never get away with that now. I actually arrived at the graduate program with a car full of paintings. That's how I applied. Knocked on his door and said, I have, I have these paintings. Can you look at them? I want to go to graduate school. <laughs> they ended up letting me go non matriculated for a year to prove myself. And then they let me in. It. So it took me three years to get a master's degree. Anyway, this, this is an angel that I made um, for my master's thesis um, at Rutgers. And the, the amusing part about this, and maybe you won't be amused, but. <laughs> because you might not have heard his name, but my teacher was Robert Morris, who was, who was like the hottest minimalist artist you can imagine. And so most people in the class were making gray boxes, because that's when minimalism was, you know, at the height. So I made this angel, um, which is on, it has wheels, it has um, plastic flowers, um, has fringe around the waist, you know, you can, you can get an idea. Um, I was also painting very seriously. I mean, this is the only sculpture I ever made, but um, I thought it was fun to show. That's me with the sculpture. <laughs> I thought that would be nice for you to see also. Dug these up recently, and that's me hiding. <laughs> um, so that's when I was in my second year of graduate school at, at Rutgers. Well, actually, third, but. Um, I then, I think I stayed in New Brunswick for a year to earn some money. I had a sociology degree, so I was doing um, various kinds of social work, and there was something called the Upper Bound Program in New Brunswick at the time, which was uh, an anti-poverty program. And so I taught 
art kid during that time, made some money and was able to move back to New York. Um, this is a large painting um, of a period that I call, you know, going through, it was the late 60s, when I was thinking about female sense of the idea of a female sensibility in art. You know, do we, I don't know if I was quite thinking about female sensibility, but I knew I was making paintings that somehow had to do with women and our bodies, and I was using flocking and lentil seeds and thread and um, things like that as materials. Um, this is another one with the flocking, and, and as you can see, the beginning of a little red with stroke paintings there, but, but definitely a sort of a fleshy figure also. Um, this, was, this was maybe on the edge of discussion is there such a thing as female sensibility and do women make art different than, than men make art and you know what's going on. Um, I began, um, well let, let me just keep going a little bit. This is kind of a, an interim painting where I still have this fleshy <laughs> sky but I'm sort of went to Europe, came back, had a hard time in Europe, was feeling kind of broken apart which is why these strokes are sort of broken apart, but that was what was in my head. Now this little painting is in the intimate painting show that's at, at the library. Um, but what I also was trying to do with these paintings when I got back from Europe was to, uh, I wanted to get the same feeling that I had in the farm landscapes, but I no longer wanted the content of the farm landscapes. So that's what, that's what, um, made me make these, you know, it's a whole series, but I'm just shy. I can only show you one or so of each, of each series. Um, this is the painting that I made when I felt, it was eight years after I started painting, and I felt like I had finally made a good painting. I mean, this, this was my mantra to myself for eight years. You just want to make it one good painting, one good painting, one good painting, and now, for me, this was my breakthrough painting, um, which had a grid, it had, it had um, paint strokes that I was spray painting and painting. And um, my daughter always asked me why I didn't go with her father to the Woodstock Festival in, wait, what year was it? 60, 69, right. And one day I was giving a lecture at the Rose Art. I could never answer Molly. Why didn't I go, Daddy? You know, you'll eat photographs. Um, I was married to Larry Fink, who's a, a great photographer. Um, and then I was giving a lecture in, um, at the Rose Art Museum at one point. Molly happened to be with me. And I came across this painting, and suddenly I realized it was August of 1969. And I said to her, that's why I didn't go to the Woodstock. <laughs> I was home painting. Um, this one's called First Anniversary. So these are these are paintings that I kind of got well known for in the early 70s when I was a young painter. Um, they called them the stroke paintings. It's about six feet by eight feet. Some are orange. When I became known, um, many art departments in the country had not yet hired a woman artist, including our own. And um, I got called, I traveled all over the country giving lectures and, and looking at student art. And the amazing thing about that experience was that every time I walked into a woman's studio, not every time, but a lot of times, um, I would look at their work and say, wow, that's amazing. And they would say, but my professor doesn't get it. Why doesn't your professor get it? Because the professor's a male. They really were beginning to um, make art that was different. They were, it was autobiographical, it was using lots of materials, it, they were writing in it, they were, um, it was just something different was going on, which is why um, when I came back at one point to visit Rutgers,
records, I was walking across the campus with Emily Allman and said, you know, I'd love to bring some women artists to Douglas so that they can um, have role models, you know, experience what some women in New York who were amazing were doing uh, the work that they were doing. So she, Emily said, why don't you go speak to Daisy Breitenbeck, who happened to be the head librarian at the time. Well, Daisy immediately, I told her my idea, I said, can we use a library? She immediately said yes. You know, it was fantastic. <laughs> um, so I began by curating for maybe two years the, the shows um, at the library, brought in some amazing artists in those first two years. I mean, these were people that did not have reputations yet, but I remember Jackie Windsor, Mary Heilman, maybe Pat Steer, I showed myself. Um, I think we did Louise Bourgeois. Um, anyway, there's a whole history that, that you can find out about, but, but that was the beginning of the Mary H. Dana Women Artists Series, which is still going on today. And I think it was the first women artists series in the country um, where anybody was just showing women artists. Um, <coughs> you know, it started slowly, but, but it really picked up full steam ahead. So these are, these are a few more stroke paintings. Um, this one's called Woman Child, because they're very vibrant, very bright, and you're not, see, you're not really seeing that. This is called Squares. I decided, you know, instead of making the grids, I, that, those, those Drug paintings were sort of for me like jazz music a little bit. You know, I would, I would get an idea, I, I would think about it, I would make sketches, I would go in the studio, and in two days they were done. So what I wanted to do was to make paintings that took a little longer in the studio. I mean, I really wanted to be involved and engaged for months at a time or weeks at a time anyway. So I, I made this painting called Squares. This is called The Storm. It's very large. It's like 12 feet, um, <coughs> where having a career when I was so young was, was not easy. Um, and what this painting was about, Larry and I bought a farm in Pennsylvania to go live there. And, and um, what this painting was about was me cover, making a beautiful painting. And every time I made something beautiful, I wanted to cover it up muddy or earth colors. So that's what this painting was about. This is interesting because the next few paintings I'm going to show you are called Small Symphony for Women. And they were inspired by said October 17, 1974. This is from a diary, one of my diaries. Perhaps the beginning of what could be my involved, a long involved project. Direct inspiration being the panel I attended last night at Douglas College. Much information behind the times. I have no idea what the panel was. Um, much infuriated me. But I can't read it. It's struck a good chord. It's a good chord, one that has been simmering. I say to myself, can symphonies be made out of this subject? I say, let's try. Symphonies of women, about women, for women, and then I name women who you know were in my life at this time, friends and family. Um, symphony with words, marks, colors, and squares. That's just a little <coughs> sketch from my sketch pad. That's called Small Symphony for Women. It's in three parts, um, which as you know was directly inspired by. Me. So in this one, I list. It's, the idea is to is to write a lot of different lists of of kind of the materials I use, um, images I use, symbols I use, and then to say something political. He says, the politics are at once separated and integrated. If there's a female sensibility, language, art emerging, how can an all-male faculty at Douglas College <laughs> choose, select, judge women artists to apply? They can't, they didn't. They only chose four in 20 in two years. They would protest, of course. That's the second panel. This is the next uh, small symphony for women, too. It's almost impossible to read the words on that one. For some reason, my computer doesn't. Oh, there it is. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I know one thing I think is the word pain and pain. I mean, I play around with that, but I'm not going to be able to read it from here. But that's, that's the first section. Um, this is another, a new painting altogether. This is called Heart On. Um, you get the idea. Um, so in this painting, I was using lots of different materials. I was by now living on the farm in Pennsylvania. The stroke paintings were very much in demand. Um, I, and I completely stopped doing them. It, it just, I just had to move on to do something else. So I stopped doing the stroke paintings. Um, hid myself at the farm for a couple of years. Made these, what I considered, you know, my sort of very feminist paintings. Um, using Valentine's heart and cotton batting and cheesecloth and just sewing. I mean, there's, there's an area that's sewn up top and stuffed and this and that. Um, so that, that's called Hard On and <coughs> during that period in 74, 75. This is called Sweet Kathy's Song, um, which is a little bit of a leap, I think. 79, um, where I, I saved a lot of the children's art. I was teaching in bed, bed Stuy, um, not as a regular teacher, but going in and doing art classes, and saved a lot of the kids' art and put some of them in this painting. Um, and this was after I'd had a miscarriage, so. Um, Totems appear, and that there's sort of a, a, a symbol of a collect. It's like a collective unconscious symbol, a kind of iconography that, that does appear sometimes when you're trying to make artwork and, and you've had a death in the family. I mean, I read about that. Carl Jung writes about that, and I read about that afterwards. But I, I began using totems right after I'd had the miscarriage. Um, this painting is is called altar painting, and it was done after my daughter was born. Um, where I'm pushing away the center of a lot of stuff and, and then just sort of leaving this altar with the images all over the sides. This one is called Welcome to this Land While It's Bank, and this was done for my daughter after she was born. Um, is that look out of focus also, or is that just me? No? Um, so that's for Molly. Um, this is Double Symphony, where I was making, using this African sculpture that I had bought of a screaming face. Um, probably done around the time that my marriage was falling apart with Larry. We had been married about 10, or ten, ten years at the time, and, and then I had a baby, and then after Molly was about nine months old, I decided I had to leave. I mean, it just was not something that, that was tenable in terms of hanging out with a baby. Um, things, things weren't good, but I wasn't willing to have things not be good with my baby around. So I left and moved to uh, a loft that I had, that I had been renting on Mulberry Street that I had to give it up. Um, this is called Dancing. This is in the print show called uh, Dancing with the Dark, or Dancing in the Dark. The show is called Dancing with the Dark, but this is called Dancing in the Dark. Um, it's a wood block, black and white wood block. Morning on Morning, and it's, and it's a very large painting um, done in 83, dealing with, you know, a lot of loss. I mean, leaving the marriage is dealing with abortion that I had with a miscarriage. This one's called Love's Deep Grace, and it's uh, done on a piece of wood where I carved into the wood on the right side, made a print, I made many prints, but I made a print that I chose to glue onto the left side, um, mostly because I love the way the wood blocks look after I cut, after I cut them, and, and they always just end up standing in your shelves for years, so I decided to incorporate this one into a painting. So that's Love with You, Grace. Um, this is called Mommy 
Y, which is also a hand-colored black and white woodcut that's also in the show at the Zimmerly. Um, Molly and I moved to a farm, kind of a farm house in Eastport, Long Island. Um, I would say in, in the second grade because I, that's how, <laughs> that's how I remember it. But, um, and the, the, the house was surrounded by bean fields. So I, I, I wanted to get back to the feeling of the stroke paintings but not make stroke paintings anymore. So I started making field paintings. And this is one of the, this is called Beanfield with Music. Beanfield with Snow. Um, and then in this next painting, as you can see, I'm giving myself a little retrospective. Um, because you can see that, you know, the whole thing, the symphony, the fields, the totems, the hearts, the house, the sewings. Um, it's not a big painting. I think it's about, it's four by five feet. This one's called The Deck Me With Bloomin. The Deck Me With Flowers, I'm Dying of Love. It's from a Hugo Wolf song, um, sung by I'm Forgetting Who. Um, but, Anyway, I remember going to Canal Street and buying this, seeing this in a flea market, this huge box of cloth flowers and bringing them home, stopping everything and making this painting. Um, and this is a print along the same lines um, called, I don't know, it might be called uh, you know, Large Yellow Nude or something like that. This is also in the, in the, um, <coughs> the print show. <coughs> this is called To Transcend the Moon. Um, in two parts. And then after I did this, I did um, Moon Fields. Because I thought if I could do flower fields or bean fields, why not moon fields? called The Altar the Orchard, and, and I did it after Molly and I took a trip to the farm for a visit, and we were driving home and in, in a bit of a snowstorm and passed an apple orchard, and I just thought it was so beautiful. And the little, all the little white pieces are little pieces of white linen glued on, which I had Molly busy doing, <laughs> helping me with. This is called Nocturne. So the paintings were getting quite dark at a certain period. And I didn't realize it until a little bit later, but anyway, my parents had died, and my partner's parents had died within the course of three years. And so it was a really intense, busy time. And all my paintings during that time were so dark. And then suddenly I realized they were so dark and decided that better get back to using some color, but this one's called Nocturne. Fields of flowers. Done uh, with the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center um, as a portfolio of about eight, actually. Um, there were maybe four or five of us artists who worked on this portfolio. Um, and it's, it's a quote that I got from a guy who's a writer for the Village Voice talking about breathing. And um, I think his name is Michael Feingold. Anyway, he was talking about loss. And he said, not to make us grieve, but to display the changing nature of grief. Not to make us cry. Um, so the changing nature of grief became interesting to me during that time. Um, this is called Faces, and it's um, a painting of, you know, during, during when lots of young people were dying of AIDS. Um, it was in the newspaper every day. I mean, there's nothing makes me happier than looking at the obituary and seeing 80 and 90 year olds dying, um, as opposed to 20 and 30 year olds, because that's the way it was for many, many years. 
Um, and I did this painting called Faces, and then there's a, an installation at the museum of something called Souls, which includes, um, I just made some details for you of, of the Souls woodblocks. Um, but you can see the whole installation at the museum. Blue uh, field of flowers. It's a blue field. This is where I'm picking myself up and using color again. Um, cherry tree, which um, going to visit my father on Fort Hamilton Parkway. I don't know if any of you know Fort Hamilton Parkway, but it's pretty grim. Um, but there was a little house that has cherry tree in the front yard, and I stopped. And it was it must have been August. It was full of cherries. There were cherries falling off, there were cherries on the ground. I took some pictures and um, it became a metaphor for me, really, for, for life and death, this cherry tree. And I, I made, as you can see, um, monoprints of cherry trees. I made many of them, but I'm just showing you two of them. One of them, the one on the left is in the show. Uh, sunflower, which is a large painting that has a, a shelf on it, catching all the materials coming off the painting instead of it going onto the floor. Um, and it's William Blake's, the whole poem, William Blake's whole poem, A uh, Sunflower Weary of Time. This is called Oratorio. It's very large, it's another painting where I put many, many images together um, of things that I've worked on over the years. You can see the pumpkin fields and cherries and moons and screaming faces, houses, sunflowers, grapes, plastic grapes, nails, etc. Our Four Mothers was a uh, I was commissioned by the Jewish Museum to make a print, and I made this print called Our Foremothers, um, which ended up to be such a complicated project because it's lithograph etching and woodblock, and every bit of woodblock had to be a separate piece and inked separately. And but anyway, in this, in this, I, I named the names and gave histories of every woman mentioned in the Old Testament, um, including. You know, um, Abraham's concubine wife, for example. I mean, I, I didn't leave anybody out. Um, and I put in names of my relatives, so, you know, my, my sister and my niece, etc. This is called Cherry Fall. And um, getting more abstract from the cherry tree. This is a print that I made at the Brodsky Center um, for the Mary H. Dan and Women's Artist Series. We, we did a I did a benefit print for them to help keep the series going at, at a more particular time. Um, called another version of Cherry Fall. And this is etching and woodblock. Silk grapes on linen. Just reading what I'm seeing. 1996. She is the earth. Um, which has a quote um, by James Joyce speaking about. Yeah, James Joyce speaking about a play that he had written. Um, he talks about the protagonist in the play called it. Um, I'm not going to be able to remember the whole quote, but it's, it's um, something about a dark, formless mother and, and uh, always, always acquainted with her fear and grief. This one's called And Always Searching for Beauty.
Symphony 6. I didn't show you the other five, but you know, I just can't do everything. I, I have over something like 800 or 900 paintings, so I try to, you know, make it into a good lecture. But um, this is called Symphony 6, and it was done a couple of years ago. Oasis, which was a print also done at the Brodsky Center. Um, and Marilyn Sims, the curator, actually has a whole little room devoted to this print with lots of proofs. And there's even a video of me make, working on the print. Um, it's a silk, it's a, using some digital imagery, but, but also something like six silk screen, um, whatever they're called, screens. It's called Oasis. Brooklyn 2010, after I got back to Woodstock a few years ago, or last year, my first painting back in the studio for the winter. This is called, um, I think it's Rosebud's White Field. It was done, it was in my last show in New York. Last one called Howl Heart, which I did after seeing the <coughs> documentary about Allen Ginsberg called Howl, which you all should try to see. If you're, especially if you're a young poet or thinking about it at all. But it's really a great <coughs> documentary about the beat generation and about Ginsberg and his life and, and um, Kerouac. And Anyway, it's called Howl, and it is on Netflix. So you can see it on the or I don't think it's in it yet. Anyway, that's it. You tell us the origin of the head with the, it looks like it's shrieking yeah. in several of your paintings. Well, um, that's, it's from an African sculpture that I actually bought um, years ago. It was, Actually, from the collection of a guy who taught painting here, he was my painting teacher named Ulfred Wilkie, and he had a, a whole collection of African sculpture, which Susan Caldwell had a gallery, was selling a lot of his collection, and I bought that piece. And it ended up to be in a lot of drawings and paintings after that. And it was a, it's only about this big, but it, it had this beautiful screaming head. How did you get involved in printmaking? Um, well, I just started making wood blocks myself in 1963. Um, and from there, I don't know, I, I was making a few etchings, and then at, at Rutgers I learned how to make lithographs, and it just went on from there. Yes? Your first wood painting when you didn't go to Woodstock, what medium was that in? It's oil and acrylic and pencil and spray paint. Had you always considered yourself an artist or was it just your senior? No, I had always considered myself a very unhappy, anxious kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, not even close. But you know, I think when I was in high school, I did have a little studio in my basement and I was painting a little bit. Because my father, who actually was a toy salesman, you know, going around he would go into New York once a week and buy toys and novelties, and then one day go to Prince Amboy, one day Metuchen, one day New Brunswick to all the candy stuff, anyway. That, but he painted also when he was younger. And then when he was an old man, he really painted well. Um, but so I did a little painting in, in high school, but then totally stopped and forgot about it, went to college, commuted, which is probably why I was not such a happy camper. I was living at home you know, where I wasn't happy to begin with, and commuting to college. Um, so I wasn't really integrated into the community, um, the what, which would have been nice for me at the time. Um, I, I, I really didn't even imagine such a thing until I was a senior in college. And I've said this over and over again, but it's really true. I, I feel like when I started painting, it was like I was speaking for the first time. Or I felt as if, not that I couldn't speak, but I felt as if 
I could talk about things that I was feeling and worrying about and being anxious about or people that I cared about. You know, somehow I felt like I could translate that stuff onto a canvas as opposed to being able to say it to anybody. I mean, I remember when I was, I don't know, in fifth grade, I had some kind of school phobia and thinking, you know, I stayed home for a few months and thinking that uh, I had a terrible teacher. I mean, she, she really traumatized me and thinking that I need to see a psychiatrist. I mean, this is me in the fifth grade. But of course, you know, in, the, in those days, your parents, my parents, would never even consider such a thing. I mean, you were crazy. If, if, you know, if you went to a psychiatrist, then you were crazy, you know. So, so anyway, when I started painting, it really was me saying to myself, oh my God, I'm going to be able to say things or discuss my feelings or talk about my feelings in a way that I've never been able to do before. And, and it's, it's been true. Thanks for that question. That was a good question. Thank you. Aside from gluing the white linen onto the canvas, has Molly followed through in any way? <laughs> Molly followed through. Uh, Molly's a terrific painter. She doesn't want to be a painter. Molly's a fabulous photographer. She doesn't want to be a photographer. <laughs> Me and Larry. But um, she's actually a documentary filmmaker. Very, very gifted. Um, she just moved back to Brooklyn from San Francisco where she got, had gotten her um, master's degree in, in journalism at UC Berkeley um, in documentary film. But anyway, she just got a great editing job in Brooklyn, so she's back. But she makes documentaries. So she is very, very talented. Uh, do you find that uh, most of your works are based on outside ex um, experiences and inspiration, or just on your imaginative um, ideas? Good question. Do you want to repeat it so everybody can Oh, so she wanted to know if most of my work is based on outside inspiration, or? Your own imaginative ideas. My own imaginative ideas. I do think it's a combination. Um, I think what happened with me is over the years I built up this iconography, this, this language that, you know, where I could speak about things that I wanted to speak about using different kinds of symbols or strokes or colors or, um, I remember thinking yellow was anxiety for years. I don't know why, but maybe because Emily's house was yellow, the farmhouse was yellow. That, that became a symbol to me. Um, but I, I do get a lot of my ideas listening to music and going to concerts. So when I go to a concert or an opera, I always have a sketch pad in my hand, and I'm always um, on to my next painting idea or thinking about it. I do this, by the way, in the dentist chair also. <laughs> it's true, because it's the only way I can get away. I mean, I, I, I go try to meditate on my, on my work or on my next painting, but... Um, I think a lot of it is coming in from internal stuff, but I also think that I'm completely influenced by landscape. I don't think that I'm terribly influenced by a lot of other artists, um, but I think I've learned, I'm, I've learned and been moved by so much music over the years, and also looking at nature, at flowers, at fields, at you know, things like that. So it's outside and inside. I guess, does that answer it? Yeah, yeah. Was there any point, like, in your life that you lost interest in painting? That I lost like, interest in painting? No, never, never. I mean, and even if I stop for two or three or four months, um, I never worry about it. You know, it's just part of the process. I've never felt like I've had artist blocks or anything like that. No, there was never a time when I lost interest. Um, I st I'm still, at this point, I'm kind of amazed at myself. Um, <laughs> I got to be 70 this year, and um, I still can't believe that I'm having painting ideas and I'm still painting, I mean, but, but I am. I mean, I'm very vigorous in the studio at this point. And also, if you see the show, you'll see a few new prints that I've made, plus I've gotten very involved in paper pulp paintings that I'm making at the Brodsky Center, which is just a wild, amazing, fun um, project that, that I've been on with Andy Um So, 
No, I've never lost interest. I mean, when you have some, it, you know, having something like this is such a gift. Um, you don't, you don't take any of it lightly. I noticed from the pictures that you showed that your work made a lot of stylistic changes as you went. Um, did a lot of those like really big changes correspond to really big like turning points in your life, so to speak? Well, you know, I, I actually think that that painting I showed you called Lines and Strokes, the breakthrough painting, really came as I was deciding to get married. Because I, I think that that sort of brought a lot of, suddenly brought structure into my life or something that, <coughs> something like some kind of solidity or, um, I, think, I think that a lot of the paintings do relate to things that were going on in my life, but you know, what you're not seeing with this kind of a show is, is everything that, you know, like there might have been six paintings instead of you saw one and then you saw a jump. But one thing does lead into another, usually, um, in a more gradual way than what you're seeing. But my work, I think, does, you know, does relate to my life. And there are times when I've done political paintings, you know, um, just specifically. I'll, I'll just focus on that. Um, there's one in the show at the library called Blood on Our Hands USA. Um, anyway. If I went off on a tangent, but um, <laughs> but it does relate to my life, but it does relate to itself also. You know what I mean? I mean, it, I'm, I'm ve I very carefully edit myself. To, you know, even though you know, once I start, I let I let let go and let the magic happen. They're very thought out, and they're very you know. I kind of have a really good idea of what I'm going to do before I do it. Um, does your painting give you like a sense of catharsis? Like, do you feel better? Sense of catharsis. After catharsis. You, do you feel better after you let it out? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a sense of catharsis. I'm very happy in the studio, and yeah, when something's moving along and it's going well, I mean, there's nothing like it. You know, creating. I mean, there's really nothing like it. Um, it's pretty amazing. And in fact, you know, when I, I, I recently had two new knees put in. Um, but even before when I was in so much pain with my knees, I'd go into the studio, I'd work for hours and not feel my knees. Walk out of the studio and be dying, you know, and realize that when I'm in there, I'm just like, there's something else going on. You know, I'm not, whatever it is, I don't feel pain in there. Yeah. What kind of music is your inspiration? Oh, and do you listen to music? <laughs> <laughs> what, um, and do you listen to music while you're creating? I always listen to music while I work. I mean, it just keeps me going. I love it. Um, sometimes I listen to the same thing over and over and over again, endlessly. Um, as, for example, when my mother died, I never thought I was going to feel the way I felt. I mean, I don't think you ever know how you're going to feel when somebody dies until after they die. And I was in my studio in, in Woodstock, listening to Mozart's Great Mass every day for one year, literally, and cried my head off every day. Um, but that, that was a very specific experience. I do listen to a lot of classical music. Um, I like vocal music. I listen to opera. Um, I listen to Nina Simone. I listen to Leonard Cohn. I listen to Rufus Wainwright. Um, you know Rufus? You all know Rufus? You guys don't know Rufus? <laughs> well, you gotta know Rufus Wayne. Right? I mean, Maggie and I are the oldest people at every one of his concerts. Um, but anyway, he's great. And his sister, Martha Wainwright, oh my god, I love her too. Um, who else do I listen to? I listen to a lot of world music. Um, I used to listen to jazz a lot, but I don't anymore. Um, I, I got into a kick of Bach cantatas, and I have all 60-something of them, and I, so that's what I've been listening to for the last year, just going through every cantata. You can really hear your strength. You can see it in the paintings. You can hear it, and thank you so much for thank talking you. with us. Um, I wonder if you could comment back on being a woman artist, which was part of the beginning of of the conversation, oh. so much less recognition. Is it different now? How did you keep going, basically? And, and do you think it's different 
Well, I was lucky. I think that I got known pretty early on. And I was very involved in the women's movement, but, um, and we do have a glass ceiling. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's hard to be a woman in, in, the, in the art world, although I think now women are getting better jobs and they're, and they're you know, showing in galleries and stuff like that, but, but it's still not easy. My question is very similar to hers, but I first want to say you are such an inspiration. I'm in your class, I think I saw you about four or five times in the library, and so I got to see you a lot more today. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have to say this, because you mentioned it in your presentation, talking to the young women right now, here in this room and anywhere else, wherever you are, I hope you will continue to talk about the fact that, you know, when the guys say, well, you know, to me or chairs or whatever the case is. In the gut, what do you tell them to say to the men who may be uh, evaluating their work? Because it goes beyond art. It goes and everything. You've already said it. You still have that glass ceiling in case people don't know about it. But what do you tell these young ladies to say? What to say? What to say? <laughs> that if it's coming from you and, and you really believe in it, you don't, there's no authority figure, male or female, that you should be listening to, honestly. It's just, it really has to come from yourself. And um, I, you know, I, I wrote this thing that I think was not published because the show just never happened, but you know, when, when Linda Nochlin said, why are there no great women artists? I, I think we're, 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 we're just on another planet, you know, and she wasn't on that planet. Um, women, women, women's bodies are different, their lives are different, their experiences are different. That there's so much that's different about who we are and what we are and what we do for men that our work is gonna be different. I mean, there's no way that it can be the same. I, I said this in, 1970, and I'm saying it now. In 1970, when I said it at San Francisco Art Institute, I was pretty much booed, you know, I remember that well. Um, you know, talking about female sensibility and women's work. But I still think it's true. I mean, and I still think there's a need for us to recognize women's work. And it's not like I don't think sensibilities don't cross, you know, that, that male artists can't be can't make work that, you know, has that kind of sensibility as well, because it does, and they do. But but there is a difference, I think, in, in, in being a, a, a male artist and being a female artist. Um, for some reason, we wanted to tell stories in the 70s. The men were doing very abstract art. You know, did they not have stories to tell, or did they, did they not think about telling the stories? I don't know. Um, but we, we, for some reason, had this urgency to tell stories and to make work that was kind of autobiographical, which is what we did. Um, so, what, I'll be happy to come back and talk more about it, but I don't know if I have more to say today, but, but I, I think it's, you know, the Douglas community seems very exciting to me. And I actually haven't experienced it until now. I've been down here printing, you know, what do I do? I, you know, I come and go, but, but this is the first time I'm really experiencing it, and I experienced it the other morning with the group of women that live together in this house, and I thought they were the most amazing group of young women. I mean, I just love having, meeting them. Yeah. Is there a way to express yourself through your paintings, so have you ever tried to be an activist, or like any particular situation through your painting? If I ever what? Tried to be an activist. Oh, yeah, well, I was very involved in the women's art movement. And I, you know, I mean, anti-war stuff, but I'm not, I'm not a political activist. Um, but I was heavily involved in the women's art movement in the 70s. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank Joan Snyder for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you.